As we uh, continue, I want to take you to the book of James, and I want to take you to James chapter 1, and I want to start in verse 17. And let me tell you why 17 and 18 are important verses. Uh, they're important verses in the sense that God's goodness stands in contrast to the temptations we face. So we have to understand that when we go through temptation, God's goodness is still greater than that. Can you, can you agree with that? So his goodness is bigger than the trial. His goodness is bigger than the temptation. His goodness is bigger than death. His goodness is bigger than sickness. His goodness is bigger than illness. Anything that is negative, he says, this is what we need, his goodness. So this is what's good about 17 and 18 is that God's goodness stands in contrast to the temptations that we face. So here is what it says. Go to verse number 17 and 18 just to begin. It says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from where? From above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Very important that you understand very clearly what that means. It's not a verse for us to just jet right through it. There's important information right there in verse 17. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. That tells me right there that nothing else is good but what comes from God. So God is good, right? We tell people God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Well, here is that scripture. Here is James telling us that everything that comes from above, from lights, from hope, from peace, from understanding, it comes from God himself. And that's how we will know the difference. We will know the difference if it comes from the bottom or it comes from beneath. That's not what scripture says. That's the trick of the enemy. So we have to understand the tricks and the truths. Tricks and truths. And that's how you will find it through the book of James in verse 17. Now, listen to verse number 18. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the words of what? Of truth. So that we would be a kind of fruit or first fruits among his creatures. Let me read it to you one more time. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. First fruits are an, is an important word. That's an important word to underline, to highlight, you know. How many of you have a, you love your highlighter and you highlight this Bible? All, I mean, if you could see what I have right now highlighted, you know. It's like there's no more white on my, on my pages here. It's just yellow, you know. And I think that's, that's the only color that's, that's found in my desk. If not, I color it different colors. But there, there is something about individual words that come from Scripture. Just the first line, listen to this. In the exercise of his will. What is his will for us? What is his purpose for us? What is it that we are supposed to be doing? How do we pray for someone when we ourselves need help? How's that for a question of questions? How do we pray for other people when we ourselves need Jesus? How do we pray for a sick person when we ourselves are sick? Well, God's will is for you and I to pray for the needy. His will for you and I is to feed the hungry. His will for you is for us to provide, to be a part of. We are to be examples of Christ to every individual that we confront, any person. From the H-E-B to the Walmart to the Sam's, down to the church, down to wherever you work. Every person that you confront or go by, it's an opportunity to teach them God's will and the example that God is in your life through your journey or through your walk. Your testimony. What is it that you have? You might not be able to quote the Bible, but you can tell people, God's been good to me. God's been good to me, and he can be good to you too. You just have to make some changes in your life. You just have to sharpen yourself a little bit. 
How many of you hate having to go cut a steak or you're cutting your chicken or you're cutting a piece of meat and you get the worst knife out of the drawer and it just doesn't cut anything? I mean, isn't that frustrating? That's the exact same feeling that I feel that God feels when he can't use someone sharpened in our community of Christians. When we don't sharpen ourselves, when we don't talk about God enough. And, and you, you, you know, I, I can only imagine, I can't believe that Eli, every time we talk to him, he's talking about God. I don't have anything else that can sharpen me or sharpen us but the gospel. Nothing else makes us better, right? Nothing else gives me satisfaction like worshiping in my car and saying, I just want to be in your presence, God. I just want to be in your presence. I just can't wait for tonight. I can't wait for tomorrow. I can't wait for Sunday. I can't wait for that next opportunity for the Bible studies, for the man church, for the inspired women's group. I can't wait to see my sisters again, my brothers again. Why? Because there's a sharpening that happens. So when God's about to use you, he's not using a dull knife, but a sharp knife, and it cuts through. It makes a difference. Can I tell you something? A dull knife is a dangerous knife. A dull knife is a dangerous knife. But a sharp knife is the healthiest thing you can be. Because something dull, let me tell you, there's, there's rust. You know, when you sharpen your knife and you don't clean it. It creates a rust, this metal that's now laid out on your countertop. How many men don't clean the countertop after you sharpen your knife? You know, come on. You know I'm talking to you. That's what happens. We don't complete the job. We just want to be used, but we don't want the consequences of what happens after the follow-ups, the talks, the calls with people. You know, when God puts someone in our place, in, in our position for us to minister to, and then we just give up, we can't do that. There are people that are hurting people. That are, so James, he says, if I'm going to test your faith, I'm going to test it by this, through this avenue. And he says these words, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. The word of truth will sharpen you. The word of truth will send a different kind of signal to God. You know that he knows when we are truthful and honest and when we fib or we lie. He knows when we pray. He knows when we've been bad or good. Oh, that's a different song, right? (laughs) He knows exactly. They stole that. Santa stole that from actually scripture here. He knows when we are bad and good. He knows when we do things that shouldn't be done. There's nothing we can hide from God. Why? What do we say? God is good. And when you're calling God good, he also examines us. James is the book of examination. How many of us love to go to the doctor and get examined? Nobody does. Nobody wants to go to the doctor. Nobody wants to stand on the scale, right? And you're kind of like, can I take one foot off? Just weigh this leg for me, you know? And, and, or they'll tell us, oh, how much do you weigh? You begin to subtract. When I was 30, I weighed, yeah, right? Come on, I'm not the only one that does it. You do it too. I know, I've been there. So that's how we know that he says, you need to live a life of truth. Can I give you the definition of truth? Integrity. You have to be known of a person of integrity. That people can trust you when they talk. That we're not going to share information. Integrity. The church becomes a church of integrity when they do what they say and they say what they do. When you tell someone, let me pray, Lillian, I'm going to pray for you, Lillian. And we have to... Know that we have to pray because she's expecting me to pray for her. That's a life of integrity. When you tell someone, I'm going to pray for you. And see, what happens with someone like me, right away we grab the phone and we call that person. Today I had the privilege to pray. Uh, We have a beautiful young lady that comes to church here and her mom is not doing very well. She says, my mom is not able to breathe very well. Uh, Can you pray for her? Uh, Tell her to call me. And we, I was on the phone with another family. I called her right away, and we began to pray. On my travels, I learned this, on my drives are the best time to call and still connect. You got to work all the time. You can't, you can't, you can't be, you know, there, there's no time to waste because she's not breathing well. We know how that works in these times with this virus. We began to pray. 
and say, God, this is a family of faith. So you have to recall on what they stand for. Every family stands for something. You have to be reminded and you got to remind God, I've been faithful, God. I've been, I've, been, I've been, you know, my integrity, I took that from you. And I've got someone right here on the line that is, that is struggling. I need your will. I need your truth. I need you to go and heal this woman. She's asking for help. What is his will for sick people? What would he do? What has he done? So go with me to verse 19. It says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and what? Slow to anger. Don't raise your hands because the camera is on, but we struggle with that. We want to speak right away, right? Instead of listen. Don't act through an emotion. Wait on God. What is God saying? So verse 19, read it with me one more time. This you know. So he's saying you know this. This, this is something that you have known, but it's hard to practice it when the world that we live in is chaotic. Our family's not in tune with us, right? And it's like, man, it's not, it's not running right, but I still got to trust God even though nothing is working out the way I want it. I got to trust God that God is in all things all the time. You have to trust God that he is, even in the negative things that happen in our lives, God is still present. He hasn't clocked out. He hasn't clocked out. He's still part of whatever you are going through. You have to understand that. So he says this in verse 19, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Isn't that powerful? When we get angry, it, does not, or it is not approved by God. How many of us get angry? How many of us get upset? The Bible says it right there. It's not approved by God. And you, you might be struggling with it right now. Hey, tomorrow it will be gone. I believe in a God that can heal us from that. I believe in a God that can calm the storm down. You know that most people will focus on the storm instead of focusing on the arm that God is stretching out to save us. But you don't understand the clouds are dark. You, you don't understand it's terrible. Yeah, but have you noticed that the hand of God is stretched out to save you? Because that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. In, in Isaiah chapter 59, he says his arm is stretched out to, to save us and his ear attentive to hear us. So we're not focused on the arm. We're focused on the storm that's in between where God is. And that's where change has to come. My vision has to change. My speech has to change. My prayer life has to change. My belief system has to change. Because we might still have some bad traditions we might still be doing some bad rituals. And we just have to let those things go and say, God, what do you want me to do? Remember, his will is more important than anything else. What's the will of God? He says these words, James may refer to his own generation of believers when he calls them first fruits, especially as being mainly written to Christians from a Jewish background, the fact that these Christians from a Jewish background are first fruits. He knew that those that he had picked were his. And you find that in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, 1 through 4. That's where you find it. Now listen to what Trapp says about these verses. He says, But hath not nature taught us the same that the apostle here does? By giving us two ears, and those open, and but one tongue, and that hedged in with teeth and lips. He's saying, don't you see that you have two ears, but you have one mouth, one tongue, even teeth, and it still does not hold our mouth. Have you ever noticed that? Two ears, one mouth, lips, even teeth to shut it. I know that sounds bad, but. You know what I'm talking about, right? Ah. Some of us have like big teeth and it still doesn't work. 
right? But it doesn't work. Because you know what we want to do? We want to respond. And James says, don't respond. Take a step back. View the whole thing and wait on God. You know, one of the things that most people dislike when they come and visit me, I talk to them and say, you know what, just, just give me a minute. Let me, uh, I'll be right back. And they, they think I'm going to the restroom or something. But no, I'm actually going to go talk to Bison. I said, Bison, what do you think? Right? What do you think about these people? You smelled them before they walked in. You know, what's going on here? You know, he does it. He just growls like that. Like, and he'll, he, he knows who, if they're good or bad. But James tells us, I, I, you have teeth, you have lips, and some of us have hair. And none of those things stop us from retaining the speech. And he says, he's giving you two ears, listen. Listen more than speak. I have a hard time with that. Any of you are verbally challenged that you talk too much? I, I, I do. I have a problem. I want to fix all the problems in the world. But I've learned that I have to take a time out and say, God, what do you want me to do with this family? How, how do I help them? For you can receive the glory. I don't want them to think that I fixed it. But I want to make sure that they know that Scripture tells us that we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. Regardless of what's happening, God is always going to be good. He hasn't changed. He hasn't changed in many, many years. What makes us think that he's going to change today? Just because things are changing somewhere away from here? Absolutely not. The Bible says that from the beginning of creation, he already had all this planned out. He knew that everything that is happening today in 2021 would happen. Everything's been written down. It's just how we go into it. So Trapp is an incredible writer. He says, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In light of the nature of temptation and the goodness of God, we must take special care to be slow to wrath. Because our wrath does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Our wrath almost always simply defends or promotes our own agenda. When we begin to lose it and we're upset, it's our agenda. It's not God. You want to make things right. And the way we make things right is just be still, the Bible says, and know that I am God. God will make things better instead of us making a mess out of things. Any of you in the boat with me? We made some messes, right? And you know how hard it is to clean that stuff up? You know how hot, how tough that is? It is tough to clean a mess that I've created. I have to go to God and say, God, why, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I hurt the one person that loves me the most? Why do I hurt the church? Why do I hurt the sheep? Why do I hurt the church community? Why am I still doing this? And it's simple. It's very, very simple. We forget the goodness of God. We forget how good he's been. We forget that standing firm against the lust of the flesh is something that we have to do. We have to have an understanding that the, the flesh is going to want to come out and do whatever it does and, and to bring glory to itself. And God says, no, don't allow that to destroy our relationship. Don't allow those things to destroy the relationship that you have with God. Listen to what it says in verse 21. He says, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of weakness or wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save what? Your souls. All filthiness. Not some filthiness. All filthiness. All filthiness. He says, all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, this has in mind an impure manner of living. In light of the nature of temptation and the goodness of God, we are to lay aside all impurity, putting them far away from us. As far as you can put it, as far as you can place it, that's what James chapter 1 verse 21 is talking about. Read it one more time. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness 
and all that remains of wickedness. In humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. That's what it says in Scripture. It, it, it needs to be done this way. It needs to be done. You know, you know when, you, when you go through surgery, you go through a, a process or a procedure, the doctor has to put you to sleep because he doesn't want you to feel the pain of him cutting the, 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 the skin or the, the, the body parts, what he's doing, and that pain is, is quiet down by the, the term of anesthesiologist. Their job is to put you to sleep, and then they wake you up whenever it's time to get up. It's depending on how much they give you, it's how much time you're asleep and you feel no pain. Imagine if there wasn't any of them to help us with this pain, how many people could last the removal of the problem in our lives, in our skin, in the inner parts of our organs? No one can. So God's given us a solution to that. And he's given us a solution to how to live a healthy Christian life. He's given us that. And through James, his half-brother, we're learning that if we trust in him and we listen more... Right? Exactly what you're doing today. That you listen more will be able to be overcomers. Who doesn't want to be an overcomer? I mean, who doesn't want to be successful? And it's knowing the word and knowing what to do. How do we do this? And he will train us. He will teach us. He's going to bring all honor and glory unto himself. Why? Because we belong to him. You are his sheep. I am just the under shepherd. I'm, I'm the one that works. He's the one that gets the glory. Oh, you want to know my boss? My boss was on that cross. And he gave his life for me. And I became the worst sheep he had. I was even stained. I was dirty. I was really dirty. But when he washed me, I became white. I was the whitest thing of white. I was like the best mayonnaise you can find. The best white rice, puffy white rice, that's exactly what I look like. Then I turned brown for some reason. Brown rice. But I was the purest. Why? Because I gave myself to him and I said, God, do whatever you want to do with this. And that's what he did. And he took the speech away. He took the cussing away. Man, you would have thought I was in the Navy. You would have thought that what in the world? But see, God uses the filth, listen, but he purifies it. It goes through a stage of cleansing, the changing, like a car wash. You go and you pay for it, and you're there, and they tell you put it on neutral, and then you go through all the processes, and when you come out, you're clean. Never forget how it felt to be dirty. And never go back to that life again. Because it says that it's a place of wickedness, a place of filthiness. That's what it says in verse 21. And listen, listen, listen really closely. In humility, receive the word implanted. So what's going to make us white? The word. It's, there is nothing else I can offer you but the word of God. The word of God will cleanse us. He will wash us. If you've ever read Ephesians chapter 5, if you read Ephesians chapter 5, that chapter... It, there's, a, there's a sentence in there where it says that we should wash each other with the water of the word. Somehow there's, there's water in God's word and it cleanses us, it satisfies us. Most people will use it in a wedding. It's a scripture that is used between a husband and a wife. You know, the, it's Jesus and the bride or, or the church. And he says that he purifies it with water that comes from the word. Isn't that powerful? That there is so much power in the word of God that it even makes filth perfect. And that's what we want to be. So what does it say in verse 22? Verse 22 is an interesting verse. It says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Okay? So that's an important phrase. Verse 22 Prove yourselves doers of the word. There's an action. There has to be an action to what you do with the gospel. What do you do with these words? 
What is it supposed to do to me? How is it supposed to change me? How is it supposed to be an encouraging word? Very simple. The Bible says that Jesus came to give us life and life to the fullest. That's in John chapter 10, verse 10. If you read that complete chapter, John chapter 10, it will express to you, it will show you exactly what that process is. Now, let me tell you, it's not an easy process. We are accustomed to being dirty. That's our nature. We are sinful people. We like to be tempted. We like things. Let me tell you, how many of you have ever enjoyed eating healthy? Nobody. How many of you enjoy eating very dirty? I'm talking chili dogs, like extra chili, extra cheese, extra... Katie's raising her hand. She's looking for a ballpark, all Angus beef, nice on the grill. I mean, exploded. You know what I'm talking about. Anybody have that at home for I can go visit tonight? But that's how... But see, the, what's bad for us, right, Miss Diana? What is bad for us tastes good. But what is good for us, it doesn't taste good. Because we are people of temptation. We, we live in a world or in a circle of issues. We enjoy this. We enjoy that. But it's not beneficial. The Bible says that those things are not beneficial. I mean, how many hot dogs can you eat before you get sick? I mean, but you can eat carrots and celery till you explode and nothing bad happens. It's just healthy, right? But we can't do that. Unless we have ranch, right, with it. Unless we put cheese on it. You know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. That's just how life is. Everything that is bad, we think it's good. Why? Because the Bible says, stop calling what is bad good and what is good bad. I've identified it as this, says the Lord. That's what he says. We have to live by the standards of the Bible. So it's not what tastes good, it's what we hear that is good. And that's why he says, be hearers, doers, and remember that wickedness, all those things, all that filth has to be removed. I mean, you don't grab a celery and you just not wash it and not cut the, the, the tail end of it and maybe a little bit of of. of of, you know, cleaning, you know, before you put it in your, in your tuna or whatever you do with celery. You don't do that. You clean it up, right? You, you do the best. You're not going to get a rotten one and say, you know what, my husband's not worth it. Here it is. Let's give him the rotten one. He won't know. Put extra mayonnaise on that thing and some eggs. How in the world can we be okay by covering filth? You see how we, we journey ourselves and we think because I wear a jacket and I wear shoes and I, I look like a preacher man that I'm hiding really my filth from God when he sees right through my mess. He sees right through your mess. You and I are together in this one, remember? We're trying to purify each other more. And there's going to be a washing process and it's not going to be easy. There's going to be a sharpening time for men and women, and we need to understand that the word is the only thing that's going to make us right and righteous in front of a righteous God. If we want a righteous God to save us, we have to live a righteous life. We can't expect God to assist us when we never look for God. How in the world can you ask the God of the Bible to help us when we never open the Bible? We can't expect God to, to win battles for us when we've never known victory through his word. you got to know his word. How many victories did we see in the Bible? Tell me about one in the Old Testament. I mean, God is so good. He brought so many people. He even won battles with a small group of people. Small group of, of an army. Something so small. And they were beating anyone and everything that came their way. Gideon learned the lesson, right? He learned it. He learned it well. God, have you seen how many are against us? Man, close your eyes for God's sake. Close your eyes and look how many are with us. But you keep on removing and He goes, get all the weaklings out. Get the first thing, get all the ones that are doubting. Get them out. These people are going to be in the way. And by the time you knew it, he has a small army. 
He goes, okay, God, he, this, is, this is all I got, and I don't think we can win. He goes, now we're going to win. See, it's not how many humans we have. It's how big our God is. And that's what I'm telling you today. The God that you serve is mighty and powerful. How do we know? Nehemiah told us. He gets sent to build a wall. And when his families or his people started doubting and struggling, they were getting tired. Why? Because it, it was day and night. I believe there were 51 or 52 days nonstop that they worked. They worked every single day without anything. They were just, while they were working, they were drinking, they were eating. And then, again, by the time you know it, God tells Nehemiah, you need to tell them that the God that they serve is bigger than the one that's coming against them. So he says these words, my God is a big God, and he will fight for us. But Nehemiah had to understand and believe the message that he's about to give. If you're going to deliver a message of hope, you better make sure you know what hope feels like. You can't tell somebody something you don't know. You can't tell people, you know what, God can heal, and we've never experienced a healing from God. Oh, God has delivered me from sin, and he can deliver you from sin. See, I already told you that I was filthy. I was a dirty, cheap, stinky, with knots. I haven't been, you know, sheared. I was dirty completely with stickers everywhere. You know, you know those puffy dogs that go through? They are exactly like that. And you can't get the stickers off, right? That's the way I was. And all Jesus did was just take his hand over me and, and take care of me. Because he loved me like that. No more abuse, no more neglect, no more abandonment. Here is a father that says, I love you and I have affirmed you. And who cares what anybody says? See, the book of James says, as long as you remove the wickedness, you got this father on your side. He's on your side and he will fight for you. You want to go on? Listen to this. 22 through 25. You ready? It says, but prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers. Who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Listen to that. I mean, you look at yourself in the mirror in the morning, right? You do your hair, you do your makeup, you do your outfit and everything. And then 5 o'clock comes and it's like, man, I didn't start like that this morning. It's like somebody like took me and tied me up to the back of the truck and was dragging me around SPID through all the potholes. I mean, at 5 o'clock, that's what I look like. So I had to go home today and change into whatever I could find. I said, I can't present myself like that. I look like an overworked whatever. But see, that's what we think we can come to God like. We, we, we think that we can whatever present ourselves without knowing that he has already paid the price. He's already forgiven us. We have to learn how to celebrate and being a believer or saved, a Christian, one that serves the Lord. If we want our family to serve Jesus, we have to act like we know the God that we're serving. You can't expect your whole house to change when we are constantly complaining, when we're constantly whining when we're constantly hurting. No one's going to follow of God that it looks like that. But I can tell you the God that James is talking about by what he says in verse 24 and 25, and it reads like this. For once he was looked at himself and gone away and, he, and has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was, but one who looks intently at the perfect law the law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So what are we doing? Acting on what we're hearing tonight. Acting on what we're hearing tonight. We have to do what we are hearing. Verse 26, listen to this. If anyone thinks himself to be religious... And yet does not brittle his tongue, but deceives his own heart. This man's religion is what? Worthless. 
So we can't express or tell people, you know what, my church, my religion, my belief, my Bible, when we cannot retain or hold back on some of the things that we say. We have to be still. Take a step back. Take a step back and look at things around you and say, okay, uh, that might not be good. That might not be good. That might not be good. It looks like that's pretty good. But this is exactly what I'm looking for. That's how we do things in life. We have to see it through the pure vision that God has given us. We have to see it through the eyes of the kingdom. Why? Because he knows all things. Listen to verse 26 and 27. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not brittle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit what? The orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. That's very, very important. How do you keep oneself unstained by the world. You got to learn to do this. Number one, turn off the internet, turn off the TV, turn off the radio. Right now, you don't want to hear this junk. You don't want to watch this junk. You want to just get into the word. Marina and I went to have lunch today, and right behind me was the TV on CNN, and I didn't want to hear that garbage. So I told the waitress, ma'am, could you please turn that down, completely down? And she goes, what about the music? No, leave the music because it was reggaeton. And I was like, what, what, what? <laughs> Don't mess with that stuff, man. Then Mana came out and Juanes, and I'm like, I'm in. I'm in. Oh, Pastor, you're like, what do you think? I'm, I come from the world of music. I come from that. I love this stuff. And then the waitress says, oh, you like to dance? I go, in private. <laughs> right? I, I can't act like, like that in here. And the people are thinking that I'm the son of something, you know? And I'm just like you. In my car, I, I pick up the volume as loud as I can. And I shake the doors with the nice sub. And, and I'm like, oh, I love this stuff. And then the song comes, Katie, if you can put it, uh, Just Like Heaven, we'll listen to that. Is that the name of the song? Just Like Heaven by Brandon Lake. And I want you to watch this video. And we'll be off camera after that, you know. Uh, but, and I start crying. It's like, what in the world? I was just dancing. Now I'm just, <laughs> what happened to this guy? The tough guy. Just, you, you cannot last in the presence of God. I don't care who you are. Holy, you are Holy. You are the perfect father. Do you have an earthly perfect father? I don't think so. But I know someone in heaven that is my perfect father. And that's what this song is all about. It's like, are you serious? Look, when they play the video, I'm going to have to leave because I don't want you to watch me completely shower this carpet with tears. But do you understand? We're starting to get the picture that we can't do nothing without God. Can you teach that to your children? Can you teach that to your grandchildren? If we teach them the ways of the Lord, the next generation coming will be different. They're going to love God better than we love God. But you have to know him with all your heart. I've got five more minutes, and I want to just share this with you before we leave. Or hear that song. You got it, Katie? Yeah. Well, we'll, but we'll turn off the video because I'm sure they'll, Facebook will not like us if we play one of those songs. But listen to this. When he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, we must receive, listen to this, God's word as a doer. You can receive the word as a hearer or you can receive the word as a doer. To take comfort in the fact you have heard God's word when you haven't done it is to deceive yourself. When we don't do these things, we're deceiving ourselves and thinking that we are doing it right and we are actually doing it wrong. Right? There's a way to do things. When we cook, right, we have measurements for some of you. Some of you just think, what, what, do you, what does that even mean? It's like Marina's mom, she goes, just, just sprinkle it. 
What do you mean sprinkle it? But that's the way they did it. Like they knew exactly how it was supposed to taste. They would tap it and there it is, right there. So what's the measurement? Tantele. Like who invents these words, right? And that's just how the way life is, you know. Sometimes tantele and sometimes no le tanteas, you know. And it comes out just blah, right? But God knows exactly what he's done with us. You know that we are to be a taste, a tasteful piece of people. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, if you lose your taste, your flavor, we're no good for nothing anymore. He wants us to be light. If you, if you, if you have time tonight before you go to bed, read Matthew 5. What an incredible read. I was reading that the other day, and I said, God, how can we not get this? How can we not get this? We are the salt. We are the light. We're going to change our community, our people. And all it takes is just a little bit of reading. Just a little bit. Amen. Do you receive the word tonight? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand if you, if you trust the Lord in all this. I, I personally have enjoyed James chapter 1. I really have. And, and uh, it's been a great, great challenge to break it down like that in, in many, many pages of reading. Sunday we start uh, James chapter 2. Let's see what James says in chapter 2, okay? I want to pray for you and then uh, Katie will, will run this video. Uh, we'll be off camera after that because I'm, I'm sure we, we can't be on with the video. But this song just completely breaks me. Those of you watching online, uh, go to YouTube and, and search Brandon Lake, Just Like Heaven. And, and listen to these words of this young man. To be in the presence of God. To call him Father. To call him Holy. When you come to the altar and you pray, you bend your knees. And you say, God, you are holy. To be able to cross through those doors and not die in the presence of him because of our sin. And he lets us come all the way to the holy of holies and say, God, here I am. Take, take my life. I want to just surrender who I am and I want to just be in your presence. That's what we're talking about. You ready to pray? Would you stand to your feet in reverence to my Jesus? He's mine, but he can be yours if you want. And we, it, he can be ours. But tonight he's mine. I, I, I just love being in his presence. I love being in his word. If you can, just hold somebody's hand right there next to you and let's pray. Oh, Lord, what a powerful chapter one. We've been on this for, for weeks. The breakdown of words in, in the gospel is, is interesting. Taking it to the purest context of, of why James wrote it the way he wrote it. And not breaking it in any way, shape, or form in the sense of personal opinion, but in the way you tell us to do it. I pray that tonight, Father, we can really trust you and, and act like this. Remove all wick, wickedness and filth from us, Father, and purify us and make us white as snow and sharpen us. Teach us to use our ears more than our mouth. Control our tongue, Father, in our thoughts. Unite us more as the house that you've given us here at Bridgeway and those watching us online. We love them, Father. We pray for them. We miss them. And we know that you have something great in the future for us. And we just wait. We wait patiently on the Lord. As David said in, in, in Psalm chapter 40, verse 1, I waited patiently on the Lord and he heard my cry. Listen, Father, to our tears, our prayers that come from our eyes. And you, Father, give us hope through your son, Jesus Christ, who loves us. We thank you and honor you today, and it's a privilege and an honor to serve you. Amen.